Here we go. Check, check. Thank you, Danelda. Thank you, worship team. We're not done worship. After I've done my little sermonette here, we will have another time of worship. So thank you, team. You did a great job. And if you were here at Christmas Eve, that was also just a fantastic time of... Uh, there was not a chair. I don't... There was limited chairs. Maybe one here, one there. But it was just a packed house on Christmas Eve. And we just enjoyed celebrating the birth of Christ together. So... Um, and just as a side note, Alpha is not just for like outsiders. Alpha is for insiders. Maybe you're just like, I'd like to just come to a study and, and be part of something. Then you can come to Alpha. You, you don't, it's not like, oh, I'm not a church person. That's the only people allowed. No, anyone can come to Alpha. So New Life people, New Life family, maybe you're just like, I need to kind of just kickstart something in my life. Come to Alpha. Okay, be a part of it. Okay, it's not just like, oh, the us and them. It's, it's anyone and everyone. Come and just discover Jesus together afresh. Okay, so that's coming up here um, here in the, in the new year. So we're going to take up the offering and, and maybe some of you have already given online like I did this morning. I went online did my e-transfer. This is the final day to get receipted for 2022 as Danelva said. So thank you all who faithfully support New Life Church. We, um, we couldn't do it without you. So thank you for all, for all of you that have faithfully given this past year and it's not too late to, to give. So you can, if you don't give today, you can go home and do it online. I think that um, Joanne said, as long as it's before 10 p.m., it'll kind of get in. But the bank doesn't always recognize stuff that comes after 10 p.m. But so, so you can still do an e-transfer later, but I'm just encouraging you, thank you for your faithfulness, and God sees it and recognizes it. Hear what the Word of God says in, in Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations rejoice and shout for joy, for you judge the peoples with fairness and lead the nations on earth. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has produced its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. God will bless us. And all the ends of the earth will fear him. And just look what's happening today. We got a group of people that have ancestry that spans across our globe, and we gather today in the name of Jesus Christ. How did this happen? It's the fulfillment of Psalm 67. The nations around the world are discovering Jesus, and now we sit together and we celebrate him today. And as it is New Year's Eve, we recognize at New Life that God is the eternal God who holds time, who created time, who created history, who has a plan, whose plan has progressed as the scriptures see. It, 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 whatever God promises, whatever God predicts, happens. And so we as his people can rest knowing that his plan is progressing. And the key question is, where are we in that plan? Okay, later on, I'm just, I'm just salting this right now so you know it's coming. You might notice in the, in the pew in front of you, I've got some blank papers kind of shoved in there. I had some great little helpers here. If not, you can just take one of those other ones out and flip it over. But you won't want the blank side. There's also some blank papers here. But later on, we're going to give you a chance to say, you know, here's what I'm thankful to God for for this past year. How has God been faithful to me? And then we're going to also talk about where do I need to commit and dedicate and, and consecrate my life to God looking ahead? What is the future hold? And, and what, 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 what covenant, what commitment am I making to God today? And, and just I'm going to mark it by, by writing it down and, and putting it on this board here. And so, so at the end, I'm going to give you a chance to participate with me in worship by, by declaring your, your praise and thanksgiving. And also, this is where I, I see God leading me in this coming year. And, and I'm, I'm committing to that. I'm, I'm covenanting with him today to, to take these steps. And so just be prepared. God's going to work in your life today. And I hope that you'll respond and participate with me in this act of, of declaration of, of how God's been faithful and, and how I'm, I'm following him into the future. And so as we prepare to take up this morning's offering, would you join me in prayer as, as we just uh, dedicate this time to him? Now, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, for your provisions, for your perfect plan, for the fact that you've brought together into this place your people, the people of Jesus Christ. And we gather today in his name, declaring him to be Lord and master and leader of this church. And as we give and bring our tithes and offerings, we do so out of hearts of appreciation and gratitude. And Lord, I pray your blessing upon every home 
every individual who has faithfully given you the portion that is due to your name. May you be exalted and may you bless those homes and those people, those individuals, as they participate with you in your kingdom business. And even today as we give, we, we give out of hearts just recognizing how you have blessed us. And Lord, you want to use new life to be a blessing in our community and in the world. And so this year, as we look into, into 2023, we pray that we would be faithful to share the truth of Jesus Christ in our community, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our provinces, in our country, and to the ends of the world. And so as we receive this offering, Lord, we do so in anticipation of what you will do through these funds, Lord. So may we be faithful, may we continue to carry your mission forward, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Ushers, would you come forward and we'll have a video that we'll watch while the offer is taken up. The new year is often a time of reflection. A chance to look back on the past 365 days and remember. Sometimes the memories bring a smile and other times they break our hearts. Chances are you've experienced a bit of both this past year. The new year is also a time to look ahead, to imagine what could be, to scan the horizon with expectation and seek God's guiding hand. It's a time to strive for better, to live louder, love stronger, and be more of who God has created us to be. It's an opportunity for new beginnings, a chance to start fresh, to pursue God with a renewed passion, and to press on with all our hearts. The truth is, God has been faithful this past year, and that faithfulness promises to carry us through the next. As the new year begins, may we remember this one simple truth. In Christ, we are a new creation, the old has gone, and the new has come. Here in New Life, we're all about moving up and out in new life in Jesus Christ. And I wanted to talk briefly about a great story in the scriptures about God leading his people because I think we as we approach the new year we we, we sit on this on this borderland of, of what is coming ahead and we look back to what has been and we look ahead to what is coming and we find ourselves kind of in, in the present day living in day to day and, and what is today hold and what does tomorrow hold um, like Scrooge, maybe we're stuck in this bad dream where we're wondering what happened, what is happening, what will happen, and, and what we find is that we can actually find God in the, all of that. And thankfully, the stories of the Bible are full of how God works in his people's lives to help them to discover him. And I don't know about you, but I, I found that, that I, I came out of a period of, of, of the last bit of history, and, and I found I, I, it was like a relief, but then it was also like, now what? Because our world isn't the same place it was before. And, I, and I'm kind of wondering what, what happens. And I, and I feel a little bit squeezed. And, and as, a, as a church, as suddenly everything opened up, it seemed like people struggled to know, what should I be doing with my life? And I, I missed out on this. So like, people were, were taking advantage of all sorts of opportunities. And, and it didn't seem like this opportunity was the number one in their minds at times. And, and I wondered even myself, what, what is God doing? In Exodus chapter 13. And 14, we find a picture of God leading his people out of Egypt into the promised land. And they've seen God work in a mighty and a powerful way. They've seen these plagues showing up, right? And, and things are getting tougher. Pharaoh is squeezing the screws on them. But, but the more he squeezes, the tougher it gets for him until finally the Passover happens. God provides a way for deliverance for his people that trust him by faith in his provision. And suddenly, you know, the, the, the plague of the firstborn comes and, and Pharaoh gets up and it's like, go home, get out, get out, leave, go. And they're leaving. They're packing up. And they're on the road. In Exodus 13, verses 17 and 18, it says this. 
When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them along the road to the land of the Philistines, even though it was nearby. For God said the people will change their minds and return to Egypt if they face war. So he led the people around towards the Red Sea along the road of the wilderness. And the Israelites left the land of Egypt in battle formation. I have here a, a map. If you can see it. You notice on the top there's a green line. That, that was the easy road, right? That, this is the, 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 you know, the interstate highway. Double laned, clear, no passes, just go, right? You know, boom, you know, direct line. But God doesn't lead them the easy way. He leads them the hard way. He leads them down south into the rugged wilderness of that area in between the, in the Red Sea there. You see that, that area there. And, and that red line shows a, a place where they, where they hit the Red Sea. It could have been lower. It could have been up there. But eventually, basically, it leads them into a dead end situation. He could have led them on the top way, but he leads them in the bottom way. And maybe your life is like this too. I mean, my life is like this. Where I'm like, surely there was an easier way that God could have led me, but he leads me the hard way, the long way, the difficult way, the challenging way. Why does he do that? So that in that journey, I can discover him. In that journey, you can discover him. Sometimes the easy highway is not the path where you discover God. And so he says, let me, let me allow you to experience some difficulties, some opposition, some, some hills, some you know, broken down transmissions, some joblessness, some loneliness, some physical hardship. Let, 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 let me journey through the, through, through, through the hailstorm and then through the, through the blizzard and then and through the dry barrenness of life. Let, let me journey you, take you through that, that long way so that in those moments you can discover me like you never discovered me before. Maybe some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because that was the last two years of your life. The rocks, the desert, the snakes, you know, just dry, 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 barren, hot. Uh, and, and, and then they're trapped. He takes them right up to the Red Sea. And so behind them is, is just a road and a path, and we'll find out shortly that, that not only is there a path, but there's something on that path that is preventing their escape. And so now they're, they're facing the, the, the ocean and, and, and an enemy coming on them from behind. But God is leading them this whole way. It's okay to enter wilderness if God is leading us into it. If our own sinful decisions lead us into barrenness, then we need to repent and get back on track with God. But if God leads us there, if you're like, I'm, I, I've repented, I, I'm holding a short accounts with God, I'm spending time in his word, but it still feels like life is tough, then it's okay because he's leading you through that because what happens was, it tells us here, God led them this whole time. Exodus 17, verse 21, it tells us, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to lead them on their way during the day and a pillar of fire to give them light at night so that they could travel day or night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night never left its place in front of the people. Can you imagine? I mean, I've wished for one of these in my life sometimes. I don't see, I'm like, where am I going? It would be so easy. Oh, there he is, just follow God. I got a picture here, right? Can you, can you just imagine? You know, it's, it's dark, but no, there it is. No doubt, where are we going? Well, right here's where we're going. As long as that's in front of us, there's nothing to be afraid of. Just keep the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire in front of you. No problem. And that pillar of cloud and pillar of fire led them right to the edge of the sea. He led them into an impossible situation. But he led them. They weren't wandering on their own. They weren't coming up with their own GPS. They weren't developing their own master plan. They were following God and he led them to an impossible situation. But in that situation, he's going to teach them something. He tells them in Exodus chapter 14, verses 1 to 5. The Lord spoke to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp in front of pi Harithoth, between Migdal and the sea. You must camp in front of baal Zephon, facing the sea. Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, They are wandering around the land in confusion. The wilderness has boxed them in. I will harden Pharaoh's heart so he will pursue them. Then I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. They camped right there. Verse 5, it tells us, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, and his officials 
changed their minds about the people and said, what have we done? We've released Israel from serving us. You can imagine, right? They've had all these slaves. They've been making all this stuff, the pyramids, the Sphinx, you know, all, all these Egyptian building projects. It's like, we just let go of the, the best labor force we could ever have. We need them back. Let's go get them. Because you imagine every other slave that's not Israelite, that didn't go with the Israelites, they're probably wondering like, okay, well, maybe, maybe we should get out of here too. You know, and so it's like, we, we got to make an example of these guys. So we got his chariot ready, verse 6. And took his troops with him. And he took 600 of the best chariots and all the rest of the chariots of Egypt with officers in each one. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the Israelites who were going out defiantly. Literally, the Hebrew text says, with a high hand. Okay, now, the word hand will appear throughout this text in the Hebrew text. It doesn't always come out in the English translation because the connotation is, is, is of power, of victory, of triumph. Of, of, and it's in this way, defiance, but, but it, it wasn't like a, it wasn't a hand with one finger up. That's what I'm saying. It was more of a celebration, right? Uh, I got to do this in the end of November when our local high school team played for the provincial championships. And uh, in a, just a, a route of the opposite team, we, we, we won. And at the end of the game, what do all the players do? They raise their hands, right? Yeah, we won, we won, right? Yeah, you know, and the parents are doing it. And, and you know, and everyone, except for the other parents from the other team, they weren't raising their hands. <laughs> We're raising our hands. Yeah, yeah, we won, you know, and we did it, you know. We, I didn't do it, but I still rose my hand because we were, it was, we were part of it, right? And, and here they are. It's, it's, they are walking away. They're no longer slaves. They're walking out of there as free people. Before they, you know, whips have been cracking their back and make more bricks, make more bricks, get your own straw, get your own straw. And now they're walking out. In fact, they're laying down because all the Egyptians have, have given them gold, silver, you know, animal hides, you know, all this other stuff because they've asked for it. They said, yeah, take it and go. So they're carrying all the gold and silver out of Egypt with their hands high. Like, we are no longer slaves. We're God's people. We're moving out. Beautiful picture says there in verse 9, the Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, his horsemen and their army, chased after them and caught up with them as they camped by the sea beside Pi Harithoth in front of Baal Zephon. So now they're starting to feel a pressure. They can see the cloud of dust behind them as the Egyptian army is bearing down on them. Now, they're strong, man. They, they've left in battle formation, but they're not a trained military force, and these chariots are coming in. But they've got some donkeys, they've got some oxen, they've got some goats and some sheep, but they can't fight chariots. It's like going against tanks, right? I mean, these guys can go fast. They can, you know, hit you with, you know, with a whip. They can hit you with their spear. They can hit you with an archer. I mean, it, it, you're just so vulnerable. And now, what is going to happen. It says in verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians coming after them. The Israelites were terrified and cried out to the Lord for help. So here they do the right thing. We're freaked out. God help us. And if only it ended there, this is good. This is the right thing to do. When you're terrified, when you're afraid, when it feels like you're getting squeezed, And we are living in that generation where we're getting squeezed. The culture and society doesn't like or appreciate what God says is true. We are getting the squeeze. If you hold to a traditional view of the family, right? A dad and a mom, kids that come naturally through, through God's intervention and procreation. I mean, I mean this, is not, this is not common or appreciated. If you, if you, if you hold a life that, 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 that a, a, a gestational fetus is, 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 is life, that God actually puts that together in the womb, I mean, I mean, that's not common. No, 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 no. If you say that old people are valuable and precious and we need to love them until God determines the end of their days, that's not a popular opinion or appreciated opinion. If you hold to the universal sinfulness of the human nature, that everyone is deeply flawed inside their heart and character. People are saying, no, 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 that's not true. We're all good. We all have potential for goodness. No, the Bible teaches a different picture. And so we're getting squeezed, 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 squeezed. If you say, yeah, there's one way of salvation, 
I mean, here, here in the, the Israelites were like, yes, there is one God. And the Egyptians like, what are you talking about? There's a whole pantheon of gods. And, and at, the, at the height of the pantheon is Pharaoh himself, the God of gods. And then, and then Yahweh, the God of Israel, comes along and takes Pharaoh's son, who would be the God in waiting. And, and then they wonder, oh, maybe we've got this whole God thing not figured out. Maybe there is one supreme deity over the whole world who is king of kings and lord of lords. Maybe. But if you hold to that, understand, you are in a minority. And there's a squeeze because, no, no, you need to accommodate other faiths, accommodate other religions, let people in, let, let, let's just mix it all together. And God says, I will not mix with any of those because I am, alone am the Lord. That's what the scriptures say. So we are getting squeezed if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're a believer in the word of God, you're, you're feeling the squeeze. If you watch the news, you feel it. You just want to go take a shower after reading the news and watching it because it, it's like all oh, this stuff is going on. You're wondering, what is happening? I don't know if you feel that way. I feel trapped. Just like these Israelites did. Pushed up against the sea, this cloud of dust descending on me and wondering, what are we going to do? And, and I cry out to the Lord for help, but then they do something which we shouldn't do. They make their own human assessment. See that in verse 11 and 12? They said to Moses, Is it because there's no graves in Egypt you've taken us out to die in the wilderness? What have you done by bringing us out, way out of Egypt? Isn't this the way we, what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone so we may serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So they're just evaluating it on human basis, human perspective. What I see is what I, what, what I believe. And, and they take God out of the picture. Like, like the cloud is, and the fire is still there. But it's like, it's, like, it's like they turn their eyes off and just look at their circumstances and they're like, oh, we'd be better off back there as slaves, getting beaten, trying to find straw to build bricks and, and, and to, to build someone else's kingdom and to serve someone else's agenda instead of God's agenda. The enemy of God would have you to serve any other agenda but God's. And he will use anything to squeeze you into another agenda. The agenda of making wealth, the agenda of pursuing idols, whatever those idols may be, the agenda of, of, you know, of, of this or that, some social agenda, some political agenda. He, I mean, and here's the, the Israelites. For years, they've been serving Egypt's agenda, Egypt's religion, Egypt's you know, goals, and finally they're onto God's goals, but they're like, no, let's go back and get back into that. And he's like, what, what are you talking about? But they're just looking at it from their limited human perspective. I don't know about you, but I, I saw it real clear that the most educated and wisest people by our world standards don't necessarily know the answers. I think, I think we clearly saw that. You can have education and, and degrees and, and, and be published, but that doesn't mean that, that you're wise or that you're smart or that you have the right answers. You know, there's a movement in our world right now that would say, let's let the smartest people get in the room and decide what's best for everyone else. And we say, no, no, we already have that right here. This is, is you know, the smartest man, man who, who, who compiled the scriptures gave us the best and wisest answers right here. We don't need any, anyone, any select group from, from all, you know, the elite of, of the world to tell us how to live life. God's already done that for us. But here they are. Fire hose in the situation. Oh, we should have just gone back. And they're going to keep coming back to that. And they look back and they, and they idealize the past. But understand, God had a better future in mind for them. But it would take for them to, take, to discover him in the present. He's leading them into an impossible situation here. In verse 14. It says there, sorry, verse 13, sorry. <laughs> Moses said to the people, don't be afraid, okay? This it occurs throughout the scriptures. Every person, man, woman that, that is dealing with God, this, tends, this comes out at some point in their, in their journeys. Like, don't be afraid because this is the natural response. Fear, fear, fear. fear. And, and you know what? Fear is a good thing, right? Like when you're going super fast, you should be a little afraid so you slow down. And you know, when you see a blizzard, you should, you know, like, like, like God gives us fear to, to, be, to be wise and to, to adjust to life. But, but here, fear has paralyzed their ability to move forward in faith. He says, don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord's salvation. 
that he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today will never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you must be quiet. Don't be afraid. Stand firm. See the Lord's salvation. You see, see, he'll, he'll play off this idea of seeing, right? Like you're, you're looking at the clouds. You're looking at the sea. You're looking at your trapped situation. But now I want you to see the Lord in that. It's look at the fire. Look at the cloud. He's there. He hasn't left you. He brought you this far. He didn't leave you. He didn't bring you here to have the first Holocaust of the Jews. This is not where it's happening because that's not his plan. He's got a bigger plan for you. Trust in him. Stand firm. He will fight for you. Just sit back and watch. I don't know about you. Sometimes I, I want to fight my own battles, right? I'm, you know, I, I like watching John Wayne movies, right? I just want to be like John Wayne, right? Just load up the six shooters and walk in and, you know, take care of the battle. But this is not what the scripture says. The scripture says, let God fight for you. If you're feeling the squeeze and the pressure, this scripture is for you. Don't be afraid. Stand firm. Discover God. See his salvation. Let him fight for you. In verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to break camp. Okay, we prayed. Now it's time to move. As for you, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. So I I brought the staff with me here. A symbol of the authority that God had given to Moses, the staff. It probably was a little longer than this, but this is just better because I don't don't hit people with it when it's this short. But there there you go, the staff, right? This, This is God's authority given to Moses, representing what God's leading here. Lift up your staff. I've commanded this, and now see what God is going to do. He is going to lead us through this situation. It's his will. He's appointed Moses to lead them. He's like, okay, I will do this. Moses doesn't freelance. He just always takes God's direction and immediately applies them. Um, Verse 16, now verse 17, it says, As for me, this is God speaking, I'm going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they that they will go in after them. And I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh, all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I receive glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going out in front of the Israelite forces, moved and went behind them. The pillar of cloud moved in front of them, stood behind them. It came between the Egyptians and the Israelite forces. There was cloud and darkness. It lit up the night, and neither group came near the other all night long. So, so God says, okay, I'm going to look after what's behind you, and I want you to look ahead to what's in front of you. And so i got a picture here. Here, here, here's this, you can imagine the cloud, right? This, this, this cloud and this, this fire, and it's there, and it's, it's blocking the Egyptians from catching them, and, and, and it's, 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 it's helping them so they can't see the Egyptians. All they see is, is the cloud. God's there. Do you understand that when you're in his will, he's there, even though when it feels like the pressure is on, the enemy's breathing down your neck, you're feeling the opposition, the difficulty. Understand, he's right there. He's right there. It says in verse 21, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back with a powerful east wind all that night and turned the sea into dry land. So the waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with the waters like a wall to them on their right and on the left. I got a picture here. just Just for your imagination's sake. There were modern liberal scholars who were like, well, you know, there was this section of, of reedy place, a real shallow spot, and that's probably where the Israelites crossed over. And Now, I don't know. Most of you have been at lakes. I know, because this is what we do in the summer in Lloydminster. When you go to a reedy spot in the lake and you walk there, what, what do you encounter? It's not hard ground, right? It's gooey, right? You, you see the ground, and you put your foot in it, and it keeps moving. 
And it covers up, you know, up to your shin. And there's this gross kind of green-brown slime full of leeches and, and all sorts of other, you know, nefarious things. And you pull your foot out and it's like, oh, that is so gross, you know. And, 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 and so, so he says he led them through on dry ground, not through a reedy, marshy, mucky, you know, shallowness. He led them through the deep part of the sea on dry ground. A miracle of miracles. And you see Moses in the front there holding his staff. God is leading them through. Meanwhile, behind them, the Egyptians are getting closer to the water. <laughs> it says in verse 23, the Egyptians set out in pursuit, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen, and went out into the sea after them. During the morning, watch, the Lord looked down. God's seeing this whole thing happening, right? So sometimes you feel like, is God really watching? Yeah, he sees everything in your life. All the difficulties, all the challenges, all the opposition. He knows all of it. He's watching. It's not a surprise to him. He's, he's looking after you. God sees it, it says there in verse 24. And the Lord looked down from the pillar of the fire and cloud and threw the Egyptian forces into confusion. Verse 25, he caused their chariots wheels to swerve and made them drive with difficulty. Let's get away from Israel, the Egyptians said, because the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back on the Egyptians, on their chariots and horsemen. So he stretches it out. The water's come down. And... It's pretty hard to swim when you're in a chariot. You know, I don't know if you've, you know, <laughs> can imagine, you know, that, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a complete end of, of, the, of their pursuit. It says there in verse 27. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea returned to its normal depth while the Egyptians were trying to escape from it. The Lord threw them into the sea. The water came back and covered the chariots and horsemen, plus the entire army of Pharaoh that had gone after them into the sea. Not even one of them survived. All of the Israelites made it through. None of the Egyptians survived. In fact, as the Israelites are moving close to the promised land, we discover that the foreign nations around all knew this story. This was an epic legend that all the nations around knew about. You should have seen the God of Israel, what he did for those people. He led them across and he destroyed the, the, the powerful army of Egypt. It said it would take generations for Egypt to regain its military strength after this event. And who's at the front of it? God is at the front of it. God is moving them forward. They're, they are trusting in him. And, and, and they don't have to, to lift a single sword. They don't have to put a single notch of an arrow in, into a bow. They don't have to pull a spear out. They don't do it. They just look back and see what God, poof, it's over. Verse 29. But the Israelites had walked through the sea on dry ground with the waters like a wall to them on their right and left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the power of the Egyptians. The Egyptians and, left, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. And when Israel saw the great power that the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and believed in him and in his servant Moses. God was teaching them a lesson that even when it seems impossible, I will lead you through. And this coming year, we need to look back and say, well, what has God done in our lives? We, there was a portion in, in the Hebrew Psalms where, 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 where when you gave a Thanksgiving gift, you were to do it publicly. You were to acknowledge in front of the whole congregation what God had done for you. And then you could come and you could make a vow to God. We're not going to do vows today, but we're going to say, this is what I think God, I need to do in my life this year. We're going to be talking about healthy habits in a couple weeks here. And, and one of the things I would like to see is people committing to reading their Bible every day. Say, so, you know what, I, this is a healthy habit. This is a, a good thing for me to do. And maybe if God said, yeah, yeah, this would be a good thing for you to do. Maybe that's it, what it is. Maybe it's, it's God inviting you to, to trust him with your future. Maybe there's something in your life you need to give up to God. And, and, and you're going to write that down on that little piece of paper in front of you or on the tables here. And you're going to put that on there and say, this is my resolve for this coming year. 
I need, I need to discover, you know, as, as a young adult, I'm, I'm giving my future to God. As, as a senior retired individual, I'm giving the next years, the final segment of my life, Lord, how can you use me? Here, today, here I am, guide me through, guide me forward. Maybe it is, I need to pray more. I face difficulties in my life, and I forget that, that God is ready to, to open the waters for me, and I just kind of get stuck in my own head and my own figuring out the problems, and God's saying, would you just bring it to me? I don't know what it is. But we want to invite you, as the team comes up here, they're going to lead us in kind of a closing set here. We're going to go over 4 o'clock. I apologize, but that's my fault, so I preach too long. But I know it's good to worship God. As we enter the new year, I, I want to sing praise to him. And, and Pastor Ben and the team have done a great job of, of you know, practicing some songs that will help us to do that. But as we sing these songs, I'm inviting you. You can take any of the sheets in front of you and just use the blank side. You can fill something out. Is there something you would be thankful for? Praise God for. Is there something you want to resolve and, and commit to God? I, I, I'd like to pray more this year. I, I, I give him my future. I, I, I want to, you know, I, I need to, you know, you know tr- entrust this part of my future to him. Whatever it is. I invite you to participate with us if you'd like to. If you don't want to, that's fine, but they're there. Because we want this to to be an opportunity for you to participate. So we're going to sing. We're going to praise God. We're going to end our service with praise. And we're going to let you respond as you want to. As you feel led to, as, as you feel, you know, inspired. And, 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 and like, yes, I, I, want to, I want to praise God. No, I, I want to commit my future to him. Maybe there's something, you, you, you know, a fear you've had. And you're like, no, I'm giving this fear over to the Lord. And I'm entrusting that portion of my life to him. My relational future, my, my health situation, whatever it is. Future, past. And in the middle is the present. And God's meeting us right here in the middle. He's, we can look back and say, yeah, he looked after his people there. He's still looking after us. And we look ahead and say, he will take care of us. He will lead us through. He ends the story. I love the book of Revelation. There's the final battle. Do you know what it is? It's, there's no battle. It's, it's like Jesus just presses the red button, boom, and it's over. We don't have to lift a, a sword or anything. He just, he, he, he just he, he decimates evil in the final day. And we who are with him are forever saved in his presence. So we've already won. So in the meantime, he invites us to, to follow him to trust him, to discover his leading through the difficulties and impossible situations we will face this year and in coming years. There's going to be some. There could be some deep valleys for some of you this coming year. But you don't need to be afraid. Why? Because God will lead you through it. And I just trust him. Discover him. Look back. Look forward. And so team is going to lead us. I'm going to invite you. There's some blank sheets in front of you. If not, there's some extra here. You can fill them out and we'll pin them up there. We'll staple them up there. And this is your chance to respond. And so if you want to stand and sing, if you want to sit and write, whatever you want to do, but the team is going to lead us. And Pastor Ben, would you just take it over and we're going to just enter a time of worship and then we'll just close in prayer and you can go on to the rest of your New Year's Eve celebration. But let's just give God this moment as we praise and then if you want to come forward I invite you to do so and put up your your praise and thanksgiving your future commitment and, and we'll be here to help you do that but let's let's just give this moment to the Lord as we end 2022 how will God lead you as you move forward let's, let's do this remiss if I didn't say we have even more confidence because Christ went through the sea for us He died and rose again. He took our greatest concern away and has provided for us everything we need for life and godliness. And so my prayer for you, and and I encourage you to come out after if you've got some time and spend some time in front of the praise and just praise God, and then come over here and pray for your brothers and sisters. I encourage you maybe that that if you have some time to come and just do that as you end your, your 2022, that we just start with a heart of prayer, a new life community church. I'm so thankful. I was just thinking about the people that came to know Jesus this year in New Life. Awesome. I was thinking about just how, you know, our kids are learning about the Word of God in the basement and our teenagers. I'm thinking about the Alpha Group. We've never done an Alpha Group. And, and, and it was so, so, so such a great team that served together. God is good. Amen? Now, we did this Christmas Eve. I'm going to do this again. 
If you got family here, I just want you to grab your family's hand. You don't have to grab strangers' hands, but grab your family. If you got a special friend, you can grab their hand too, but uh, just hold on to their hand as we pray to leave here today. A prayer of commitment as we just sang. Let's pray. We praise you, Lord, for what you've done this past year in our lives. And today we look forward to what you will do next year. Lead us, Lord. Guide us. Be with us in every step that we take, that you would receive glory. Now may the God of peace be with you. May he fill your homes with joy. May his love enter your lives and flow into the places in which you live and go to school and, and interact with people every day. And may people come to know Jesus Christ through you. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everybody said? Amen. Happy New Year!